All right, welcome to another live edition of the Couch GM podcast. This is technically going to be epi episode one of the, the Gary Hill Jr. show on the Couch GM. So first off, Gary, really appreciate you taking the time today. No problem. Great to be here again. Looking forward to it. Yeah, so we were talking a bit off air, but the Mariners, you know, ended up winning that last game in Toronto, uh, game six of their their road, the first road trip of, of the uh, the year, first Milwaukee, then Toronto. Welcome back to the States first off. And what are your initial thoughts of the Mariners at this point in the season? Yeah, we all made it back. That's good. Uh, it was good to have an off day too. It, it wasn't, wasn't that long of a trip, only six days, but it was lengthy. So uh, a long trip. Uh, you know, it's funny. I've been thinking about this today and what we've seen so far. And this statement is going to sound kind of weird, but they're just not playing well. They haven't played well this season. And I think that's different than like, they're not a good team. I think there's a difference when you think about baseball early in the season. I find, I find baseball early in the year really hard to talk about because the sample size is so small yet. It's the only thing we have. So I totally get why people may overreact to what we see because it's literally all we've seen. And from a Mariners perspective in particular, you know, we've seen them get buried early in a season and in the last three years and had to do so much work to get back. And it was successful in one year, getting the playoffs and fell just short in the last two years. So I think Mariner fans are even more uh, sensitive, I think, to the beginning of seasons. But uh, one specific example, I think, We'll explain what I'm talking about when I'm I'm talking about the Mariners not playing well as opposed to not being a good team. Like if you went through starting pitchers ERA team wise, I know ERA isn't everything, but for mm -hmm. our, our example here, I, I think it works. Like Colorado has the worst ERA for starting pitchers in baseball. And when I look at them, it's like, yeah, I think they're going to have problems with the starting rotation through the course of the season. Like, I don't think this is necessarily fluky. It may not be near seven, which it is now, but I think the rotation is going to struggle. And the Nationals, they have the second worst rotation so far this season. And I think it's a similar story in that I think they're going to have some issues when it comes to the rotation. And, and But third on that list is the Mariners. And when I look at the Mariners, like – they're not going to have the third worst rotation ERA in baseball. They're too good when you look at that rotation. So that's kind of how I think about the difference between a team not playing well and a team that may just not be good in an area or two or good overall. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you're talking about ERAs right now. At the top of the list, the best ERA in baseball right now is the Boston Red Sox. Yeah. You know, starting rotation that, we didn't really think would have, you know, be in that type of position, but after spending three games against the Mariners in Seattle, just throwing benders the entire time, they just ended up, you know, with that span and ending, ending up with the best ERA up to this point. Uh, Houston Astros right now are 28th best in ERA. And, you know, their rotation obviously is banged up right now. And unless they're throwing a no hitter, it seems that they're not winning games right now, which is pretty crazy. You look at the standings in the AL West, you know, up to this point, 13, 13, 14 games in the Astros are four and 10. Mm -hmm. So if that tells you anything. It's like, we know who the Astros are probably going to be at some yeah. point this year. Same thing with the Mariners. You know, it's just, they're underperforming right now. That's it's yeah. as plain as that. No, it's a great example. What's interesting though, about the Astros, I do feel like there are some things that can happen early in a season that can change expectations that mostly revolves around injury. So the Astros thing is unique in that, like how long is Valdez going to be out? You know, if he's missing for a long period of time, that's really going to hurt Houston. What does Verlander look, look like when he gets back? You know, I was expecting Hunter Brown to take kind of a next step this year. Now it's only been two starts, but he really got knocked around this last time out. So I wonder what that's going to look like. So it, there are some interesting things when it comes to the Astros. And I think we've seen, you know, at one point it looked like the Astros pitching depth was bottomless. It was just endless every year. They were just going to bring guys up and have no issues. I think last year was the first time that we saw a glimpse like, okay, maybe it's not endless. And this year they've really been hurt with injuries. So I'm curious to see where this goes with them. Yeah. So 
you know, getting into there's the the Mariners starting rotation that I just kind of gl- glanced over. There's the the Mariners lineup overall from top to bottom. Something like six out of the nine guys right now in the lineup are hitting below the Mendoza line. Yes. And it was news to me. I looked up. I knew what the Mendoza line was. I didn't know the history behind it. Oh, and yeah. it turns out that it's from the 1979 Mariners. Yes, so isn't that ex- <laughs> pretty fitting that the entire right. Mariners roster is the one that's flirting with the Mendoza line. <laughs> I mean, so, yeah, I've thought about this with Mario Mendoza, the former Mariners shortstop who was named this after. I do wonder, like, I don't know if that's what you're going for as a major league player to have like a demarcation of struggling named after <laughs> you. But at the same time, it's made him famous. So like Tommy John has his surgery. Mario Mendoza has the Mendoza line. So that's better than nothing, I guess. Right, right. So Getting into kind of the the clubhouse vibes, I'm curious on you know what the players are are feeling right now. You, you uh, I'm sure, have talked to some of those guys and had, have you know have talked to Scott and the media availability. Yeah. What are the vibes currently in the clubhouse? Are people still are they grinding at this point, or is it just kind of like a you know it'll come at some point? Yeah, I think they're all confident. I don't think they've been shaken at all by this start and in fact you know a lot of those guys have been there with this particular team you know they've seen this with their own eyes and and able to get things going i mean they wanted to get off to a better start that that kind of goes without saying but scott talked about it too he's loved the energy in the dugout the last couple of games even through the struggles so there's been no effects in that way i it's funny i always think stretches like this affect fans and broadcasters and everyone else watching more than the players and partly is because players can't let it affect them this game is brutal when it comes to to the mental side of it and there's so much failure all the time like if you are living the ups and downs as a player like you're just not going to survive it's just too hard it's the grind is is too tough as it is so i always feel like they do a better job of dealing with these stretches than the rest of us watching it yeah in this game i mean it's it's a game of failure it's a game of streakiness and so you just have to stay hot when you're hot and when you're when you're cold it's just a matter of staying level-headed and just getting through that one person that we've seen a huge huge positive in this year and we've been hoping that it would be coming from him attending driveline baseball this off season is Ty France. You look at his metrics on baseball savant. He's in the 95th plus percentile in pretty much everything. Average exit velocity is one of the, the tops in the league. Hard hit percentage, sweet spot percentage. It's the ball is just jumping off his bat right now. What are you seeing from Ty France? Yeah, I'm seeing all that, which is great. Uh, the, the hard hit numbers to me are really impressive and, Hard hit rate is something I look at a lot. Hard hit balls is something I look at all the time, and I take a lot of stock in. Nelson Cruz said something to me that I'll never forget. A a guy that obviously knows about hitting, it was he said it so simply, yet it's so perfect. The harder that I can hit a ball, the better chance I have of getting a hit, right? And so that's why it's true. That's and to me, that's what hitting is. Like the the more often and the harder you can hit the ball the better off you're going to be. And so seeing Ty France do that early in the season has been great. He had a kid too. He was away for a couple of days. Now he's back and a little more tired, but he he <laughs> played well in Toronto. But I think in the long term, when this offense gets going a little bit and I think the lineup settles in, man, if he can just approach who he was a couple of years ago, it's just really going to lengthen the lineup and it's really going to pay dividends for the Mariners. So I think you're right that that's a really good sign for the Mariners here in the early stages. And we've talked about it before, you know, his down year is league average every other year. Aside from last year, he's been 25% plus above league average as far as overall production of the plate. So anywhere close to that is a, is a great bounce back for Ty France. Yeah, and they don't need, with this lineup, at least how I think it's going to play out, like they don't need him to have 30 home runs or something he's not capable of. Like just be the type France you were a couple years ago, right? Just have a bunch of doubles, you know, uh, increase the on-base a little bit, and that's the kind of production that they need. Just Absolutely. Don't, he doesn't have to be anyone he's not. And it was, you know, a year or two years ago, he was batting third in the lineup every day. Now we've seen him climb back up with other guys in Jorge Polanco. Mitch Carver has been struggling. So he's found his way back up into that, into that three spot. 
how do you, do you think Ty France might be able to, to secure that spot long-term or, you know, it's a good question. Uh, you know, and I, th I think I'm going to answer that. This is not a shot at Ty France. I think it's better for the Mariners or a better sign for the Mariners if he's not in the third spot, because to me that, that tells me that Polanco and Garver and kind of the guys you expected to be in the middle of the order are those guys being the middle of the order bats. Hanniger, throw those guys all in the mix. So although that, that may sound like a slight at tie. It's really not. I'm thinking more about what the lineup looks like when they're really cooking, when they're going. And to me, that means Polanco and Garver especially are in the middle and hitting. So, but he, yeah. he could, like he's obviously capable, but I think it's better. And I think the Mariners lineup will be better if he's further down. Yeah, absolutely. And we're, we're talking preseason. Yeah. The reason why Ty France is batting seventh is not because he's struggling. Like, well, like, like we said, league average was his down year. It's just t speaking to the true depth of the lineup that the Mariners have been able to put together this year. And this is one of those years where I've been looking forward to every person's at bat in the lineup because everyone has, has the potential to do something. It's not like prior years to where you get, you know, two thirds of the way down and then it's like, all right, I can go, you know, make a drink or something. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, that's, def that's definitely cool seeing the the difference in lineup this year. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we, we haven't seen the production yet, obviously, but I do feel like when I look at the track records, I look at the lineup one through nine, I feel like it's going to be a good offense and you know, where that ceiling is. I don't know. Like that's the question that hasn't been answered yet, but I think they will hit. I think they will score. I think they will certainly score enough. I am curious to see with health what that kind of looks like once things get going. Another guy that has some some solid metrics so far, it leads the team in home runs right now is Dominic Canzone. Preseason, you know, we were talking again about, hey, this could be a guy that could have a, a breakout season. You know, his numbers aren't all there yet, but, he, you know, the Nelson Cruz metric, he's hitting the ball hard. What, what are you seeing from Dominic Canzone and, and his approach at the plate? Uh, the power's legit. That power is legit. And it, we saw it last year. We saw glimpses of it. Uh, the huge home run in Seattle off the windows. It, and he's gotten 15 pounds of muscle added on, and it really shows. But I know the Mariners are super excited about what he can be and the power potential especially. I don't know coming into the season. Like, I didn't know. There's so much variance I think about what his final home run total could look like this year. Like you could tell me it would have been five. You could tell me it would have been 25. Uh, but from what we've seen so far this year, like it could be on the upper end of that scale, which is pretty exciting. Now there's still some work to do, obviously with, you know, some of the swing and miss outside the zone and lefties in particular. So there are, there are going to be some growing pains, I think. But, man, when he runs into a ball, it is no joke. It is really loud, and he barrels it up. And he does have a history, you know, in going through the minors. Like, he barrels up baseballs fairly consistently. So uh, I know they're excited about what he can be at the end of the day. And he's, he's going to get some run. I mean, he's getting a lot of playing time. So he's getting a chance to prove himself. Yeah, he won that starting spot out of spring training. Um, over Luke Rayleigh. That's another guy that I'm curious on. You know, he made a close to making a, a, a stellar diving play in the outfield. What what have you heard or seen from Luke Rayleigh so far? And, you know, I'm curious if if that platoon role is going to fit him well. Yeah. So I kind of think that eventually Luke Rayleigh is going to get consistent at bats during the course of the season. I always tend to think things like this tend to work themselves out. And sometimes, unfortunately, it's going to be because, because of IL. I mean, that's that's going to be just something that the Mariners are going to have to deal with this season. When we look at the lineup right now, they're just not going to get through the year without guys getting banged up. And, and Rayleigh, I think, is the next guy up right now uh, for – Take your pick. Like when France was gone, Rayleigh was in the lineup. If Garver goes on the AL, it's going to be Rayleigh getting those at bats. And mm -hmm. and I also think he's got a chance to hit himself in the lineup. I think Scott is going to be a hot hand guy 
uh, when it comes to this season. And I think that especially plays out at third base and that plays out in the outfield, left field in particular. So just because Rayleigh is not getting a ton of at-bats early on in this season, I don't think that is that's going to tell us what his year is going to look like. Cause I think at the end of the day, he's going to end up with plenty of plate appearances. And it's funny cause you, you look at him and you wouldn't necessarily think this, but he's a really versatile guy too. He's incredibly valuable. He's a guy that is the backup in center field and the backup at first base, which is it's a weird skill set. Yeah. He's a guy that when the Mariners needed a pinch runner off the bench, he was the guy like, you wouldn't think to look at him. If you need a home run off the bench, he's the guy too. Like he's really valuable in this role that he's playing right now. But I also think he'll get starter ish plate appearances. Cause I still look at that outfield as kind of a four outfield set because we've seen it already once, but Hanniger will have to get some days too, as it goes on. So I think he'll get some plate appearances, but I also think he's pretty valuable dude all around. Yeah, watching him at first base, he can play the position. So yeah, we'll see what we can what we'll see out of Luke Rayleigh moving forward. Mitch Hanniger, guy that came back this offseason, he's been solid at the plate. What have you seen from him in the clubhouse on the field? What has that impact been with with Mitch Hanniger? Uh Clubhouse Scott has raved about him in the clubhouse. Jerry DePoto, too. Jerry said to us that. This is the best version of Mitch Hanniger we've ever seen. And he said that not only with what we're seeing on the field, especially in spring, but with him off the field as well. He has always been a worker. He is a guy that like, if you get to the ballpark, you can never find him. Is he's off doing whatever. He's he's constantly working. Uh, from what we've been told this time around in Mariners uniform, he's really been great at imparting his wisdom to his teammates and he is mm -hmm. Mitch Hanniger is appreciated. Like there's a lot of workers on the team and he's appreciated being in that group as well. So I think the most important thing is he's looked really good so far this season. He's healthy so far this season. And when I think about Mitch Hanniger and what his year will look like, I think the production will be there as long as he's healthy. Cause even last year with an injury March season in San Francisco, when he was on the field, the, the underlying metrics were all good. He's still hitting the ball hard. He's doing all the things that you want a hitter to do. So as long as he's healthy, I think he's going to be there. And I actually think like my, my expectations defensively weren't really high for Mitch coming in just realistically, mm -hmm. but I think he's moving around pretty well too. He's looked pretty solid in right field defensively, which is great because as we know, Garver is going to be the DH. So Hanniger's going to play a ton of right. And so far so good for the most part. Yeah. And Mitch has always impressed me. He's, he's one of those guys that is, is just a pure hitter. Yeah. He's always putting together solid at bats. He gets those hits through the, through the gaps in the infield. So yeah, like you mentioned, it's all about the health and he's had a fluky injury history in the past. So it's just a matter of keeping him on the field. Yeah. Hopefully it, no more bad luck this year. He's had some rough ones through the years. So hopefully stay away from those fluky ones. Yeah. If you're watching the stream, make sure to uh, comment any questions that you have for Gary about the Mariners, about baseball. And one or two, one of the questions that came across actually was about Julio. Of course, we had to get into him at some point. Yeah. What are you seeing from Julio? You know, Golden Sombrero, the final game in Toronto. It looks like he's, you know, struggling. He's struggling a bit. Yeah. I'm curious what you're seeing from him. You know, it's funny. Uh, take away that last game. I've. I felt it was coming for Julio because I was looking at the ex Avilos and he was piling up some big ex Avilos. He was going triple digits a bunch of times. There was one game and he was one of the handful of guys who had three balls at like 104 and above without a hit in the game. Like that, that's not something that happens very often. And it's been that kind of run for him. Like Milwaukee hit the ball hard a bunch of times. Toronto, he did as well. Some of them were on the ground, which we know once he starts getting in the air, that's when the production starts to come. So it's funny because I felt like when we were watching him last year, we could, we saw a lot of wild swings, especially with guys aboard. I don't – like he still is chasing out of the zone some. I don't feel like he's doing it as much as this year. I don't have his chase in front of me, so maybe I'm wrong on that. But it, it does – the plate appearances feel different to me. 
Uh, I feel like he's pretty close despite that last game in Toronto because I, I feel like he's hitting the ball hard. He's gotten some in the air too. And as we know, once he gets going, like watch out because he's one of the best hitters in the game. So I feel like it's closer than it's not, if that makes sense. Just kind of yeah. watching it play out day to day. Yeah. Just going to take a hot, you know, home series against the Cubs and the Reds to get him going. And then, the and then he's off the races. I, I mean, it, it feels like he tomorrow against Chicago, he could have a three hit game. And then the next day he could have another three hit game because we've seen it. And then yeah. all of a sudden it's off to the races and he's putting together a great week, a great two weeks, a great month, because that's the kind of, that's the kind of hitter when he's locked in, he's one of the best in the game as we've seen. Absolutely. And then sh shifting over to the starting rotation, you know, the first times few, I've been a bit shaky. Luis Castillo hasn't looked quite like himself. George Kirby had one solid outing has gotten hammered the, the other two times. Uh, yeah. Bryce Miller looked insane the last time in Milwaukee. And I want to ask him the question on the sideline about the splitter. I'm curious if he grips it different ways because it's breaking both arm side and glove side. Some There was multiple times where I thought he threw a curveball, but that then they go to the slow-mo <laughs> and it's a splitter. It's like, how can you even hit that when it's breaking both directions? It's just an amazing pitch. So what are you seeing from the starting rotation as a whole? Uh, let's start with Miller. That yeah. was that was nasty, man. Yeah. That splitter was sick. Like, yeah. He looked great in that start. And, you know, as we talked about coming into the season, the thing about the rotation that I was most anxious in, and we haven't seen it from Wu yet because we haven't seen him on the mound, but, you know, Miller and Wu were both dealing with the same issues against lefties. And right. if they could just pull back some of that production off of lefties last year, you just, you wondered, you dreamed what that could look like for Miller. Like that would be a big step. And what we've seen so far is that splitter is legit uh, against the Brewers. Lefties were 0 for 13 against him in the game, yeah. which is amazing. Yeah, And I know the Brewers, they're not stacked lefties, but they have some legit guys in the lineup from the left side. They've so, got Christian Yelich in there. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> you know, it's a big league lineup full of lefties. So, and, and teams will keep attacking it with lefties because that's what they've been doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, to me, that's a great sign for what Miller can do. And it, it's so funny because he comes across as just kind of Texan and just kind of strolling along, but he is so – his mind about pitching is unbelievable. He he really knows his craft. He dives into it. He knows all the numbers. He is such a joy to talk to about pitching. He's so fun. Uh, and he's as in depth as anyone on it. Uh, he can tell you, I mean, he can tell you the degree drop on splitters, like the whole thing. He's got it yeah. all. So uh, that's really exciting to me moving forward. Now, the rest of the rotation, it's funny because I feel like uh, most of the ire has been directed at the offense so far this season for the slow start. And I get it, like, the offense hasn't been great so far this year. However, I do feel like the rotation has been kind of overlooked in a lot of ways about how much they've struggled so far. I already alluded the third worst uh, starting rotation ERA to start the season. And I think part of the problem that it was recurring, and we saw it a couple times in the Blue Jays series, you know, the offense got put in a hole. You know, they were they've been down two, three, four, nothing within the first three innings. And can they overcome that? Yes, but like against Brios, for example, they were down four, nothing going into the fourth. And Brios, he's a legit guy. He's a really mm -hmm. good pitcher. And I think in a game like that, especially with an offense that's struggling, but that's a big ask to me to ask the offense to, okay, go put four runs on Barrios and then try and get a couple more against the bullpen. I just right. realistically, that's, that's tough. We know that the backbone of this team is the starting rotation. They have all-star Cy Young potential with their top three. Mm -hmm. The rotation is going to be fine. It's going to be great through the course of the year. It just hasn't pitched well as a whole so far this season they had like a six game stretch where they gave up i think 30 runs in 24 innings Jeez. <laughs> which is not something i think we'll see moving forward they're going to be fine but 
if, if you ask me about the struggle so far this season, I think the rotation has been a big part of it. I have really high expectations for the rotation. I think everyone does. I think they mm -hmm. do for themselves. They just haven't lived up to them yet. I think they will. You know, Castillo has been hittable so far this season. We've seen flashes of Luis being Luis, but at other times he's just left a ball or two over the plate and they've tagged it and it's made the difference. And I think uh, all three of us starts so far this year, Kirby, we've never seen him give up as many runs as he's given up in his past two starts. Right. Oh, so he was super frustrated after the last one. I think both Kirby and Castillo are going to be great this year. I think they're going to be fine. And I think they're going to contend for the Cy Young Award, despite the start. And when they do, the Mariners are going to be fine. But just, I think it's really played into the start so far this season. Yeah, it's tough to have to come back in every game. especially. You know, they, you know, I think on the six-game trip, I think they scored four-plus runs in four of the six, right? And... I think if the Mariners consistently score four runs, they have done a ton, but during the long stretch of the season, if they can consistently score four runs a night or roughly, they're going to win a ton of ball games. They haven't in this stretch, but they will during the course of the year because their pitching is going to be fine. It's going to be good. A pretty wild stat is that the Mariners have scored the most runs in the 10th inning. <laughs> so far this so far this year than any other end you know compared to every other inning yeah yeah the, the last game they scored as many as uh what any game on the road trip so it was actually i i'm i'm excited to see how they come out against chicago because to me that was a feel good win for the mariners like psychologically a great one for the mariners because you had logan shove mm -hmm. so the rotation did their part you had the offense you know i was waiting for just kind of the, whew, you know, the breakthrough, the relief of having a big inning like that. And not only did I have that, but it led directly to a win. So uh, I'm curious, you know, momentum isn't the right word because, you know, momentum next day starting pitcher, but just the psychology of that carrying forward, maybe take some weight off coming back home against Chicago. And who better to do it than the owner of the Blue Jays himself, Cal Raleigh. <laughs> <laughs> it is like clockwork, isn't it? Yeah. Fr from the left side of the plate, from the right side of the plate, he hit the home run opposite field from the right side of the plate, you know, uh, yesterday. So that was, that was really good to see. And I, and I've heard that Cal put in a lot of work from the right side of the plate this yeah. off season. Can you speak to that also? Yeah. And it's uh Scott service. Give him some credit too. During spring training, he tried to match him up. It's so hard in spring training because Pitching is so random. You never really know who you're going to see, except for like the starting pitcher for the two, three, four, five innings that they happen to pitch. Mm -hmm. But Scott was very deliberate. Whenever there was a lefty starter on the other side, whether we was we were going to Mesa or Scottsdale or staying home, like Cal was in the lineup consistently against lefties, and that was the reason. And it's funny because it's really worked out where it's been kind of a natural platoon the last few years with Tom Murphy because you had Cal from the left side and we know Murphy really battered lefties. So mm -hmm. it just became the natural breaking point when you get, give Cal a day off. Well, like, yeah, spot Murphy against the lefty. This is a different scenario this year where Cal is the number one. He's always, he was the number one last year, but mm -hmm. he is the guy this year. Like he's only going to get days off when it's a, day game after a night game on a Sunday. Hey, although against the Blue Jays, he played on Sunday. It was a little later start, so it wasn't quite day after night. But he's going to play more against lefties this year. So I think it was really intentional for Scott and for Cal, knowing that, that that's the deal coming into this season, to make sure he's square from that side of the plate. And as we know, John Snyder talked about it after the game. They flipped him on purpose to face from the right side because teams know that too. Like teams know how deadly he is from the left side. So they're going to try and turn him around when they can to bat from the right side. So like that is going to be a storyline to watch through the course of this year about how he handles lefties from the right side. Yeah. And I, I don't have the quote on me, but I, I did see the quote <laughs> from what Ryan Divish, his tweet, Cal Raleigh talking about John Snyder. And yeah. that was an, that was an amazing quote. It was an amazing quote in the Snyder thing. It Aaron and I talked about this a lot last year when he said it. It's like, man, 
you kind of call out the guy who's been killing you the last couple <laughs> of years. Like, why, why, why do that? I mean, it's funny. What he said wasn't, it was like, whoa, 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 this is awful. But there was like a little, little jab at Cal in there that I just, I'm not sure I would have gone down that road if I were the manager of the Blue Jays at this point. Just, just add fuel to the fire. That's that's exactly right. And the way he hits already in Toronto and the way against he hits against the Blue Jays in general, it's I don't know if I'd want to stoke those flames. Right. <laughs> Going back to the starting rotation, um, real quick, I have I have Bryce Miller's baseball savant pulled up. One of the impressive things is that he's been able to diversify his pitch arsenal so much from last year. His first month he was throwing like 70% four seam fastballs. Now he's throwing his four seam fastball 37% of the time. The splits now around 24%. Then the sinker at 18, the slider and the sweeper. So that diversification and that he's so confident in the splitter and that he's able to throw it so much and and locate. You look at the command charts and and yeah, things are looking great for him. It's amazing. I talked to him about this too. And because I was talking to him about last season fastball heavy obviously as you just pointed out and it's funny i was talking to him about adjustments like during the season and how hard it is and he and he said the obvious like here he is he's in the big leagues for the first time they're trying to win every game possible every game is possibly the one that can take you out of the playoffs or get you into the playoffs yeah and he said he's pitching in front of 40,000 people. He's like, that's not the time to make, <laughs> make the adjustments <laughs> and throw a new pitch. So he knew coming into this off season, that's when the work would come. It, you know, a lot of, in a lot of ways, uh, it's similar to what Logan Gilbert has done through the course of his career, because it's funny to think back when Logan first got to the Mariners, like he was fastball heavy and man, I've been just so impressed with what Logan has done. Uh, and the pitcher he's turned himself into because we've seen it already a couple times this year where he hasn't had the great fastball yet he's been dominant because he's overhauled his secondaries and they've been great and they've been different they've been uh, great at different times like his splitter two starts ago was really the pitch that was working for him and yesterday it was his slider that was the real go-to pitch. He has just really turned himself into a great pitcher, which has been a joy to watch. And I feel like Miller is kind of headed down that same road, like fastball heavy guy, but he's, he's turning himself into a great pitcher. Yeah. And I've, I've really seen him from Logan. I've seen that cutter a lot and looking at his, his metrics, he's got the slider has been his most dominant pitch so far, 32%. That's his primary pitch, you could say. The forcing fastball has now backed off to 28%. The cutter, 17%. So he's really starting to work in from that four seam to the cutter. He mentioned in spring training, it's to get guys off of that four seam fastball. You can't just wait for that straight pitch and just swing out of your shoes. You got to expect something with the break and a bit slower on top of that slider also. So yeah, very promising stuff from him so far. The first time I saw the cutter in spring training, it threw me off too. We don't have stat cast, so we're just watching the game. And it was like this high pitch at like 90. And I'm like, what? What What was that? Because it, it looked like a fastball. That's not his fastball. He's not throwing it at 90. So, yeah, like I totally get it. Like it's, That's not something a hitter would expect to see. And just enough of a wrinkle just to change from the look of the fastball that, that that's been an interesting pitch to watch progress. Yeah. And then the number five starter in the rotation so far has been Emerson Hancock. Brian Wu has been on the injured list. How is Brian Wu progressing with, from his injury? Is he on a throwing program? And then with Emerson Hancock, you know, he got roughed up quite, quite a bit that, yeah. that last start. So we will get an update from Justin Hollander tomorrow, first day of a homestand. We usually get the injury updates. So I'm curious to see, like I haven't heard in the past, uh, since we were on the road, I haven't heard where Brian Wu was at. So I'm anxious to get that. I'm also anxious to get a little more detail about Brash mm -hmm. and Santos as well to see what both guys are at. Scott mentioned both the relievers in Toronto, and it sounds like they're both progressing, which is great. doesn't sound like there's been a setback, which is great. Uh, so I think we'll have more information coming up tomorrow, knowing exactly where all three of those guys are at. Uh, it's been a struggle for Hancock, obviously. Uh, I, his 
first star was was fine like i would take that every time out the hancock mm -hmm. uh, was it five innings three earned runs allowed and got in some trouble worked his way out of it like i think you take that each and every time the hancock goes out and he just got hit hard last time out i mean there's yeah. just there's no two ways about it and you know with his stuff it, in early in spring he had eye popping velo for hancock we saw it 96 97 we haven't mm -hmm. seen that sort of velo uh with his two starts so far and so with what he's throwing 92 93 ish like he's just got to be the command just has to be better. He just can't leave his pitches over the plate. And I think it's just as simple as that. And then on top of that, you know, he doesn't have the most experience at the major league level. He, right. he got some exposure last year, but now he's really being thrown into it at the start of the season, right out the gate. So you make, you make a really great point too. And this is something I was talking about and like telling myself this, but I think it's a lesson for everybody. I think we've really been spoiled. <laughs> with the last group of pitchers that have come up, starting with Logan and then Kirby and Miller and Wu, like the last four guys we've seen in the rotation have essentially got to the big leagues and everything has been great. They've taken off. That is not reality for most major league pitchers. Like most guys come up and there are ups and downs, there are struggles, there's demotions, there's promotions. You know, th it's not just like we get here and we're great. And essentially it's been that way for all four guys. Like they've gotten here, they've stuck. Now they they've had some ups and downs and they've adjusted, but for the most part, the production has been incredible mm -hmm. for four guys in a row. It's yeah. happened. So I, I keep telling myself like Hancock has like five major league starts under his belt. And so drawing any sort of conclusion, I don't think is, is fair for Hancock and, like we have to look at him as a typical young pitcher that will have up and ups and downs, and then we'll just see what happens. And then, hey, expectations for me when he takes the mound, just try and keep the Mariners in the game. Honestly, try and keep the Mariners in the game so they can win the ball game that night. That's what you're looking for. Really, out of any five starter, the Mariners are unique because you don't necessarily think that of Woo, but. Uh, for five starters around baseball, that's kind of the deal. And so that's the deal, I think, with Hancock. Yeah, and you make a good point. I mean, we've been extremely spoiled. You know, the fact that Bryce Miller and Brian Wu were drafted a year after Emerson Hancock, and they're, they've been able to do what they did last year in the rookie season coming into this year. You know, these guys can be aces on some teams, you know, yeah. pretty much all of them. So, yeah, to see Hancock come up and, kind of grind his teeth you could say t into some experience and and really trying to find his way hope hope he can find it and and then yeah we'll have to see with brian Wu tomorrow on the injury report how soon he can come back and if they're gonna ramp take a while to ramp him up and get him to the point to where he's back in the rotation i mean hancock pitching effectively is going to be a key for the mariners because we know about their starting rotation depth and hancock is he's the first guy up and you know, the, who would be next? I'm not sure, but they could really use him. This is Captain Obvious statement. They could really use him pitching well and filling the hole when they need it filled. Speaking off that, a uh, recent signing, Dallas Keuchel, and then also the, you know, bringing back Levi Stout. What have you heard about those two guys in, in Tacoma? You know, I actually had the Keuchel game on because it was the same night that Hancock was pitching. So, uh, you know, while we're doing our thing broadcasting the game. I actually had the Keuchel game on and, you know, it looked like Dallas Keuchel, <laughs> I mean, it was, you know, the slow stuff, the curve, the whole thing. Uh, anytime I think you can pitch in Salt Lake city and not give up anything. I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know, it's not a major league lineup, but pitching in Salt Lake city, really anywhere in the PCL and not giving up runs. I'm like, that's, that's impressive, which I say the same thing about Levi Stout too. Uh, cause he, he had a really good start last time out and I know they're excited to have him back. I know he's excited to be back and he is a wild card for me, Levi Stout, especially when you look at the starting rotation depth and who would you go to next? Yeah. Keiko could be one of those, but Levi Stout is on the short list for me. And I thought his stuff 
we didn't see him much in spring, but we, we did see him. I thought his stuff looked really good. Um, I was wondering whether they'd go bullpen route with his return, but he's in the rotation in Tacoma and he could figure in the rotation depth. And, you know, he pitched really well in the Mariners system. It just didn't work out for him at all in Cincinnati. Uh, but maybe they're able to unlock, unlock him so far. And from what I remember, when the first time he was with the Mariners, he's one of those guys with with the big potential fastball. Yeah, so. yeah. Which is why I was thinking, I was wondering if bullpen could be a future home, or you're just letting the fastball eat for the most part. But yeah. I don't know. So far, so good. We'll see how it plays out. I mean, man, you know how the PCL is. Anytime any guy can hang zeros in the PCL, like, whoa, <laughs> that's that's amazing. It's so hard for me to draw any conclusions from PCL ball particularly, but also minor league ball in general, because like, I don't get a chance to watch the games very often. Cause we're, you know, we always have our stuff going on and the, the stats can be so misleading. So during the course of the year, I try to have as many conversations with you know, the Matt Pierpont's and CJ Gilman's of the world, the guys that are really connected to what's going on to try and like, really figure out what's happening uh down there because it's it's just from like looking at the stats perspective i find it to be really difficult to actually figure out what's happening and that's why the guys you know in the mariner system they always their last level is typically double a because yeah. they don't want their guys to go to triple a and get hammered around a bit and lose their confidence it's like double a major leagues it's hard because those are such great hitting venues and you don't want a young pitcher changing what they're doing, changing what they did to get there because they're getting beat around in Las Vegas or whatever. Like that's the last thing you want. Right. Yeah. And then um, getting into the bullpen a bit, you know, we saw Stanek has looked solid that yeah. hundred mile an hour fastball that, that splitter. Munoz struggled a bit. You know, he walked four out of five in Milwaukee. The next night he gets that opportunity. He's able to, to lock down the save. What have you seen from the bullpen so far? Any guys that we should keep in mind? I'm going to look up his name. I, I forget his name, but I saw him the other day in Toronto. He has elite stuff also, like a 98 mile an hour sinker. Oh, and a Brett giant ball. Yeah, Brett DeGust is who yeah. you're talking about. So I have been really impressed with the bullpen. Uh, when I look at the Mariners so far this season, we talked about the offense, they've struggled. We've talked about the rotation, they've struggled so far. I think the bullpen has done a great job, especially the context. Like they're missing two of their huge guys, right? And Munoz, outside of that, that was a bizarre outing, the right. four walk outing, which uh, I mean, he's never walked four in a start, be uh, in a, an appearance before. Hopefully he never will again. It was an unfortunate way for that game to end. I think for the most part, he's been solid. Uh, you know, the other kind of core Stanek's been good. Spire's been good. Mm -hmm. They haven't had a lot of leverage to work with, honestly. So it's kind of hard to judge them on how they've closed out games because there haven't been that op many opportunities, but you know, the guys, you know, we're always looking for the next Spires, the next Topas, the next Seawalds of the world. Uh, Bolton, I thought was really impressive before, you know, kidney stone unfortunately I, I guess the good thing it's not an arm injury or anything right. hopefully we'll see him back shortly uh but that's too bad because i thought he looked really good so far i thought snyder looked really good too uh fortunately he didn't break his kneecap with the Man. one on two off the knee which is yeah. awful that's always uh, bad fortunately it, i was talking to him about it. it it was just below the kneecap into the side so it didn't get him square on the kneecap so he's actually feeling right a lot better right now, which is great. Cause I think his stuff has been really good. Like his stuff plays. So I've been impressed with the bullpen with who they brought to start the season. And I've been impressed with the guys that have come in like Tyson Miller, who they were really excited about in spring has come up and thrown a couple of solid innings, just doing the low slot thing and the slider thing that so many Mariners relievers have done. And that's looked good. And the Gus you mentioned is super intriguing to me. Because the pure stuff is great. It, it you watch him pitch, and you would never expect or never think that there's a guy who's appeared almost 50 times in the majors with an ERA over seven. 
Like, wow. how is that possible? But his stuff has ticked up, and that's been one of the big differences. He's really stood out in spring training, so much so that I'd never heard of this before. He he didn't start in major league camp. He was in minor league camp, and they were like, whoa. <laughs> brought him to major league camp. He didn't make the team out of spring, but he opened a lot of eyes, and he was one of the first calls made when they needed somebody. But he is super intriguing because that stuff is pretty gross. Yeah, I never heard of him until I saw him in the game. I was like, who's this? And then I'm like, wow. That's, yeah, he's one of the, that he's curveball one of the, just drops off the table. Yeah, and it's it's one of the it's one of the great things about watching every single pitch of a thirty game spring training season is wow, there are some benefits once in a while. It's one where you know he'd get buried in like the eighth inning of a random game in Scottsdale that wasn't on TV, so you wouldn't get a chance to see it. But there there I am watching him blow ninety eight on the gun. It's like man, where did this come from? So yeah, he's he's intriguing. Speaking of velocity, Logan Evans, he's one of the guys at Double A right now that's been piquing the interest this this spring. How quickly might we see him rise through the ranks? It's so funny that you mention him because the great thing about spring training is everyone's in the same building. So I end up having a million conversations with staff up and down and front office and and just about everything about and one of the questions I always like to ask is like, who should I be watching? You know, as the Mariners are playing out this season, like who's, who's jumping out? Who, who should I know? And no joke, Logan Evans, everybody talked about Logan, whether it's Joel Furman or Pierpont or DePoto, just go down the list. Like he was the first name to pop every time. And Aaron and I talked about this too. We think it's hilarious because here's a guy from Pitt who had a career seven ERA or whatever at Pitt. You know, he he was a weekend starter at Pitt that didn't he didn't jump off the page. And here he is, like his stuff. Everyone just raves about his stuff. And the the speed he could get here is the one is the question for me. Like I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. So let me start with that. I'm not sure. He's moved pretty fast so far. They love him. And as we've mm -hmm. seen, like they've been aggressive with guys. Once you get to double A, you're there. You're on the doorstep, especially on the pitching side. So I, when somebody gets to the stage that he's at already, it could be any time. I don't think that like it's not gonna be next week. I don't right. think it's gonna be next month, but he's on the radar and he's in range. Uh, I'm I'm very curious to see what his production looks like because they love him and he was he's the perfect name for you to bring up because he is if you're talking about who's the next guy to make an impact, the next young guy to make an impact in the rotation, like he seems like the guy that's gonna be it. Yeah, because the Mariners had their wave of big starting pitchers come through their system. They shifted to the focus of drafting hitters. Yeah. And so the depth in the minor league system for the pitchers isn't quite where it used to be. So to have some names like this kind of pop up and be that next potential guy is always intriguing. Yeah, they need that because I imagine that we'll see some more drafted pitchers coming up this year because of yeah. that. As, as you mentioned, they're really deep when it comes to position players offensively. Uh, but yeah, they, they're going to have to manufacture a couple of pitchers here to fill that gap in between like the next uh, draft class of guys that are going to come up and who they have now. Cause you never have enough. You're, you're always going to need to produce pitching and you're always going to need to produce starting pitching. And fortunately the Mariners has been pretty good at it. And Logan Evans could be the next great example, just low draft pick, uh, a guy who did not jump off the page in his college career yet. Here he is. And it, we had a chance to briefly talk to him in spring. Like he sounds so thankful that he landed with the Mariners because he talked about how they've changed his career. Mm -hmm. And, and we've seen a play out with a bunch of guys. It, it, it's actually amazing to hear guys talk about it. It's, it's no secret. Like talking about whether it's Trevor Miller or Snyder, who we talked about as well, like the reputation is there. Like people know the Mariners help you get better as a pitcher. And uh, Cody Bolton said to me, 
they change guys' careers. They turn guys' careers around. And to me, that's a pretty big statement. Yeah, and talking with Horton last year when he was traded over, I asked him about it, and he was like, I've heard what they've done here. I'm just super pumped. And yeah, everyone that comes through, it's and they're really just telling them to pitch to their strengths and to do more stuff instead of not doing other stuff. Yeah, you know, that's the beauty of it too. It, it's They're not... The positive the, reinforcement instead of the negative. That's right, uh, which plays a part. And the other thing is, it's not just one plan that they're trying to pigeonhole with every guy. It is really unique to each guy. A lot of it is the confidence part that you're talking about, but also just in seeing what the individual pitcher is good at, seeing what they're not good at, junking that, and just moving forward with what they're good at, instilling the confidence, showing them the numbers, showing them the evidence, the data, and it, it's working. And, and it helps, like Gabe Spire now, who's – in the bullpen, such a big success story last year. It really helps when you have guys like that, that are, you know, it's not coming from the coaches. It's coming from the players too. Like, Hey, they've got a plan for you. Follow the plan. You're going to have success. And this is like Snyder was telling us last year when he was in Kansas city, he had a conversation with Spire last year before Snyder was obviously a Mariner and Spire was telling him then like, cause Snyder's like, what's going on? What you're having such a great year. And Spire was telling him like, They've got a, they had a plan for me. I followed the plan. I'm doing this, this, and this, and it's working out. So, so Snyder was super pumped when the Mariners got him in the off season. Absolutely. And, uh, we, we have a few more minutes here. I'm curious, you know, uh, non-Mariners related, we've seen some big names in baseball go down with injuries, starting rotation, Spencer Strider, all these guys. I'm curious if you've had any conversations around the clubhouse or with some of the the broadcasters and what do you think might be going on here? Because it's, it seems like a consistent thing. Like every day, another big guy in a rotation is going down. Yeah. Which I hate. Cause you just, you want to see the best of the best on the field. And, you know, I, I read a couple of interesting articles because the thing that was hard for me to figure out is are the injuries really way up or to just to seem like it because man it just seems like it's the a list of guys uh, they're getting hurt and so it just it stands out more mm -hmm. i've seen some uh, i guess a couple of things written that the injuries aren't, aren't really up that it's more of that it just stands out because it's some of the best of the best it's also frequently this year because and it makes sense you think about a guy like bieber who was hurt last year goes through his off season, has to back off. I mean, you can in the off season, right? Because you're not pitching. You can back off and not throw for three weeks or whatever, but then you get back to the regular season, you throw again. It's like, uh Oh, and so was that injury really from this year? Was that injury left over from last year? So that kind yeah. of stuff often happens at the beginning of seasons, but it is critical that we try and figure out how to keep pitchers and players as healthy as possible. It is so complicated, I think, when you talk about starting pitching. Because the reality is starting pitchers are trying to be the very best they can be, and baseball teams are trying to win games. And right now, like throwing as hard as you can and spinning it as much as you can, like as a pitcher that helps you get paid, that helps you be effective. And as a ball club that helps your team win games, like go out there, don't go deep pitch five, pitch six best you can and call it good. So like, how, how do you tell a guy not to, not to do that? Or how do you tell a team like we're trying to win the game here? And I think that's what fans expect too. So I think it's a uh, really complicated situation. I don't think there is an easy solution to – because I think guys throwing as hard as they can, I think that's part of it. I, I think that makes perfect sense. But how do you tell a guy not to do that? Like what? Right. I, I don't know. I have no solution to this at all. I, I think it's it's a really difficult problem to tackle. Uh, but – you know, I just, 
it's a conversation that has to be had because it's just critical that we try and keep guys as healthy as possible because it's the best for the game. Like we want to see the best of the best on the field. And especially with pitchers, like it's so tough when guys are gone and gone for a year. It's not Mm -hmm. like you're on the IL for a week or two. Like Bieber's gone for a year, a year, year and a half. Yeah. Year and a half. Really? I mean, Robbie Ray, how long, I mean, doesn't it feel like it's been forever since we've seen Robbie Ray pitch? Oh yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's tough. So uh I know that's not much of an answer, but uh yeah, that we talk about it. No one has I don't think anyone has the answers at this point. Hopefully someone smarter than me can figure it out. Yeah. No, yeah, I mean, like you mentioned, everyone's trying to get their payday and what pays the most is the is the velocity, the spin rate, the strikeouts, all that stuff. Yeah. And, you know, Shane Bieber went to the drive line this off season. They were flaunting, you know, his up velocity, you know, Spencer Strider came in with a new curveball. There's all these different factors and Spencer Strider, like five weeks before he actually got injured, had a statement about the pitch clock, but all these injuries have been happening even before the pitch clock really started. Yeah. Whether it's amplifying it or not is a discussion and that should be looked into, but yeah, I'm with you. It's, it's not good for the game at all, especially when it's, the top guys in baseball, yeah, some of the man. best pitchers are going down. Yeah. Yeah. The Strider one too. It hurt. I mean, he is so fun to watch. That one was a real dagger. Potentially the best pitcher in baseball. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, it, it just, it changes the fortunes of teams. It's an obvious statement, but man, you look at Atlanta with Strider and you look at Atlanta without Strider. It's, it's a big difference. It's a big difference. And during the season, I mean, I guess you can make a deadline deal at some point, but you can't replace Strider. You just can't. He's one of the best in the game, if not the best in the game when he's on. So I, I just, my heart breaks for the game uh, and especially for fans of Atlanta and for fans of Cleveland. Like this is going to be, chances are, Bieber's last go around in Cleveland. You know? He's right. That was probably the last pitch. Yeah. And he probably wasn't going to resign with Cleveland. You, you never know. Maybe he was going to, but now the fans don't get a chance to see him in what may have been his final year in Cleveland, who has been a great pitcher for that organization. Yeah. And, you know, Cy Young upside. Yeah. He, he won one back in the day. I mean, he looked great against the Mariners. We were talking about Tom Hamilton, who saw him a lot in the spring and he, he declared Bieber's back, and then we went and saw him pitch, and it's like, yeah, he does look back. He looked great. And he's one of those guys, he's not, you know, 95, 98, right. but he's low 90s, and he just can locate like no other with that fastball and slider. And so, I mean, there's there's always going to be pitcher injuries. That's, that's the nature of it. it. This thing is not a natural human movement, so there's always going to be pitcher injuries, but is there something we can do to help lessen it, lessen the rate? Hopefully we can figure out how. Absolutely. One question uh, from a fan here to wrap it up. Mitchell Hopkins asks, who has stepped up as the leader for the for the pitchers this season? In years past, it was Robbie Ray. It was Paul Sewald. from what he heard. Hmm. He's curious if, if someone has taken over. I know Luis Castillo in years past has been one of those guys is has it been the rock again or has it been a mixture another person yeah i feel like gabe spire has been one of those guys in the bullpen uh really leading the charge uh you know it's it's funny when you look at the bullpen like andres munoz is like the longest tenured bullpen guy (laughs) it feels like he just got here right but he's been there the longest uh i think stanick helps in that regard too because he's a guy that i mean he's been through it he's been world series games and you know, he's years and years of on winning teams. So I think not only was that move necessary because of, Hey, they needed somebody in a setup role to get it to Munoz in the ninth. But I think having a guy like that, that's been through it all is really helpful. Uh, you know, the, the starting rotation is interesting to me in terms of leadership because they all go about it and really different ways they're all so different in terms of people but they click really well together i I think my favorite is the castillo miller interplay just watching them exist as two people (laughs) with each other is super funny i think i think there was a 
I think it was during spring training. There's an interview where Castillo was messing with Miller the whole time. So yep. uh, people got to, yeah. So you got a glimpse of what I'm talking about, but it's that kind of thing all the time. Uh, so I don't, uh, the leadership question, I don't know. I, I feel like they're all in the rotation anyways. They're all in their own way kind of leaders, especially the top three, I guess. I should be more specific. Yeah, makes Miller, sense. No, but yeah. Yeah, I saw an inter interview in the dugout. Luis Castillo was putting a cup on Bryce Miller's head the entire, uh, the entire interview. And Bryce Miller, in an interview, he stated that like Bryce says the same words, the same few words to Luis Castillo, and they say it. That's like a, kind of their interaction, but they yeah. know what you know the vibe that they give yeah. to each other. That's just kind of more of what it's about. Yeah, it's great. I think Lou. I think Luis has been more vocal this year. Like he. He hasn't been that guy, I think, in the past, but I think he's been more so this year. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a the rotation is such an interesting dynamic be, because of who each guy is. Like Logan is so different than George, who's so different than Bryce, who's so different than Luis. That they're all, I mean, they're all hugely successful, very different people. Kind of like their pitching style, you know, they, they each have their yeah. own arsenal. They're each their own person. They have their own way of doing it, but the sum is greater than its, you know, parts. So yeah, combination of them all. Yeah. And it's, it's one of the credit too, I think to the Mariners where, and Scott believes this is like, you let your guys be themselves. And that's one of the mantras we hear whenever we talk to players, they talk about it all the time, but, uh, when you look at <laughs> each starter as an individual, you can see how that pays off. Absolutely. Well, Gary, thank you again for jumping on. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. We'll uh, do this again throughout the season. So make sure to look out for these live streams as they come up and we'll see you on the next one.